Welcome to video 6 in our series on tensor calculus. In the last couple of videos, we've examined some of the more commonly used coordinate systems. In this video, we're going to talk about coordinate transformations. Suppose we have an n-dimensional space with a point P, as you see, represented here. Well, we might choose to analyze this space with a coordinate system that could look something like this. Well, in, in tensor calculus, we typically use the letter Z as a generic coordinate system. And we identify the individual coordinate values with an index in the upper position, Z1, Z2, all the way to Zn. Notice these are indexes in the superscript position. They are not exponents. Well, we've made the point um, quite often that there's nothing special about any particular coordinate system. So we're also going to be analyzing our space with an alternate coordinate system. And it's represented uh, generically this way. It's the same idea, except the uh, indexes also have this prime symbol here. So that's the way we distinguish between the Z system and the Z prime system. We talk about using the unprime system and the prime system. And of course, we can use either one for our analysis. There's no reason why any one is preferred over the other. So I'll put them both back up here just so you can see that they are quite different. Well, a point like point P now can be identified or represented in either coordinate system. So we would say this, that our point P can be a function either of our unprimed coordinates or of the primed coordinates. Well, in uh, many applications, it's quite uh, useful and convenient and sometimes essential that we be able to transform back and forth between these two coordinate systems. So we might be working with a point or objects in one coordinate system. We might need to know how they look in the alternate coordinate system. So what we need is a set of functions to perform what we call a coordinate transformation. So what we're going to need is a function that looks something like this. We're going to have our coordinate value z1 prime is going to be equal to some function. And it's going to be a multivariable function. We'll label it with an upper index with one prime as well. And the arguments of this uh, multivariable function is going to be the coordinate values in the unprime system. So um, the arguments here will be z1 and z2 and all the other coordinate values all the way to zn. So the idea is that we're going to substitute in the values of all of these unprimed coordinates into some multivariable function. And when we do all the processing, the math and whatever, it will result in a single value for z1 prime. Well, of course, to do a full coordinate transformation, we're going to have to have similar functions for each of the z prime coordinates. Now, a set of functions like this taken collectively are what we call a coordinate transformation. A coordinate transformation like this gives us the ability to transform from the unprimed system to the prime system. For example, if we know all of the individual coordinate values for our point P in the unprimed system, we simply substitute them into each of these multivariable functions. And after performing the operations and calculations, we arrive at the individual values for the coordinates in the prime system. So by knowing the coordinates in the unprime system, we now are able to transform to the coordinate values in the prime system. Well, this is a very uh, straightforward and easy to understand concept. And you'll see it in many mathematical disciplines. It's not something that's unique to tensor calculus. However, let me show you now what a coordinate transformation like this would look like using tensor calculus syntax. What we'd have is something like z i prime. 
being equal to z i prime with an argument simply of z. Okay, what I'm going to tell you now is that this one expression, this one line right here, is the exact equivalent of all of these expressions taken collectively. This one line by itself represents the coordinate transformation from the unprimed system to the prime system. Okay, well, how does that work? Well, of course, we have n different relationships here. We have uh, n different multivariable functions, one for each of our coordinate values, but you'll notice they all have the same form. At an abstract level, the format of each of these expressions is identical, except for the fact that there's a different value for the index here. Well, instead of writing these expressions over and over again, we can simply write the expression one time and replace the specific index values with a variable right here. And when we use a variable in this form, we're using what we call a free or a live index. Now you're going to see the use of free and live indexes over and over again as we move forward. You're going to see that as we develop relationships and equations like this, they almost always apply simultaneously to all of our variables at the same time. So instead of writing them down one by one, we'll just employ the use of a free or live index. It's one of the fundamental techniques of tensor calculus. Okay, well, you'll notice some other things, too. First of all, notice that we use the letter Z here instead of F. And uh, we do that simply to cut down on the complexity. On the left-hand side of our expression, this is a variable. But on the right-hand side, it's a function. We know it's a function because it has an argument. And we do this because we don't want to keep thinking up function letters all the time. We just let the context of the expression tell us whether it's a variable or a function. OK, the next thing is that our argument is a single letter. It's not a list of arguments like this. Well, here's the convention in tensor calculus. When we see a letter like this with the indexes suppressed, we say that this one letter by itself means the same thing as all of this. See, this single letter, it is implied that we're talking about the full list of arguments 1 through n as they're listed out here. Cuts down on the complexity of the syntax and makes it a lot easier to work with. Now, the beauty of this uh, syntax convention is that this sort of expression works for any number of dimensions. If we have only two dimensions, then the value of i prime can be either one or two, and there would be two arguments in this list. If we're dealing in a three-dimensional space, we know that we have three expressions, and the argument list is going to consist of z1, z2, and z3. So we don't have to change the expression if we're talking about two dimensions or three dimensions or five dimensions or 50 dimensions. doesn't matter. The same expression works no matter what the number of dimensions might be. All right, well, again, what we have here is a coordinate transformation. If we know the unprimed coordinates, we can substitute them in here and compute the primed coordinates. We can transform from the unprimed system to the prime system. Well, what if we need to go the other way? Well, we'd need uh, expressions that do just the opposite. So we'd need an expression like this. We'd need something like z, and I'll use the letter k this time, is equal to a function zk. And the argument this time is going to be the z prime coordinates. We represent that just as z with a prime symbol here. This, then, would be what we call an inverse transformation. Here, if I know the z coordinates, I can calculate the z prime coordinates here. And here, if I know the z prime coordinates, I can calculate the z coordinates 
which I could then substitute back here again, and around and around it goes. These are the inverse of each other. I can transform from here to here, or here to here, or back again. Okay, a couple more comments here before we uh, end the video. First of all, I used the letter K here. Why did I do that? Well, I did it because I could. One of the rules of uh, free or live indexes is that I can use any letter I want to for them. It is not the particular choice of variables that matters. It's the fact that I use a free or live index. The fact that there's a live index here tells me that we're dealing with multiple expressions at the same time, uh, always equal to the number of dimensions in the space that we're working with. Now, it also means that if I want to, I can rename the indexes anytime I want. So I could have used J prime or Z prime up here, and I could change the expression anytime I want to go from one variable to the other. It all means the same thing. Now, the rules of uh, free indexes are that, first of all, a free index, when used, must appear in each term throughout the expression. It must appear in the same position, either in the upper position or lower position throughout. And the free or live index has to be unique throughout the expression. If we're using more than one live index and in expression, each one of them has to be unique. But we are free to choose whichever ones we want, and we're free to rename them anytime we need to. Okay, well, my last comment is right here. You'll notice that because we suppress the indexes of our arguments, we place the prime symbol right on the letter itself. Now, in our expressions, we always place the prime symbol on the index itself and not on the letter. But in cases where we have to suppress that index, we just put it on the letter itself. And it's understood, as we expand these arguments out, that this is going to be z1 prime, z2 prime, z3 prime, etc., all the way through. All right, well, with all that having been said, I think this is a great place to bring the video to a close. But uh, as I do, I want to mention this. You know, the first five videos have been about fundamentals and things that were not necessarily specifically related to tensor calculus. It's only here in video six that we begin the process of looking at specific tensor calculus syntax. Well, what I want to do is, uh, from this point forward, I want to build up a little uh, cheat sheet, if you will, of all of the takeaway results that we have in each of these videos and put them together collectively in a set of notes. And I would recommend that you do that as well, uh, because we're going to build up a lot of expressions, and it'll be nice to keep track of all of the takeaways as we go through the videos. So let's end the video here, and we'll go over and do a quick review of what we've done. What we did in this video was to develop the idea of a coordinate transformation. We said if we know the coordinate values in a z prime coordinate system, we can use those as arguments to a set of functions and derive the corresponding coordinate values in the unprime system. Likewise, if we know the coordinate values in the unprime system, we can use those as arguments to a set of functions and derive the coordinate values in the prime coordinate system. These are coordinate transformations and they're inverses of each other. The other major takeaway here is the use of a free or a live index. We said that when we have an index like this, it tells us that we're working with multiple expressions at the same time always the same number of expressions as the number of dimensions in the space we're working with. So if we're working with a two-dimensional system, we'll have two expressions. If we're working with three or more dimensions, then we'll have three or more expressions. All right, we also said that when we have the arguments in an expression like this, we'll suppress the index. And the implication by syntax convention is that this uh, suppressed value here represents a list of all of the individual values. So z prime expressed this way means z1 prime, z2 prime, z3 prime, etc. throughout. Now concerning the free indexes themselves, we're free to choose any letter we want. We don't have to use i, we could use anything else. The rules are that we have to have the free index in the same position in every term throughout the expression 
and that the index has to remain unique throughout the expression as well. Okay, now as we go forward, we're going to develop similar um, takeaway summaries like this for each of our videos. I would recommend that you begin a little notebook in which you uh, put these down by hand in your notebook. There's something about doing it by hand that will really reinforce your understanding of the, these relationships. Now I'm going to make all of this available as downloads if you want to do that later on, but I strongly recommend you do it by hand first because that will help you learn and reinforce all this information as we go. In the next video, I'm going to show you examples of how these transformations work in each of our sample coordinate systems.